Greetings all and welcome to another special edition of Starship Star Vexer, where I'm beaming aboard a very special guest. I call him special because he survived eight years within the proximity of the Clintons, as well as remaining a very nice person. It takes a special kind of person to do that job and stay such a nice gentleman as he is. So, Gary, how's life treating you? Well, life is treating me very well. As most of your li- listeners know, it's great to live in the United States. Since President Trump's been president, it's, uh, things have been going very well. Life is good. Thank you. We have so much to talk about. I'm sure we're going to talk about a little bit about uh, Monica Lewinsky and a little bit about the crumbling Secret Service. And the reason I got in touch with you is because of your latest video. You are being besmirched or slandered by people who are calling you a liar. And you have all the proof in the world that everything that's in your books is the absolute truth. What's up with that? Right after my first book, Crisis of Character, came out, it was about a month afterwards. A friend of mine, uh, his name is Mark Halbrin. I talk about him in the first book. He was the attorney, a friend of mine who was an attorney, who helped me during Bill Clinton's impeachment scandal, the Monica Lewinsky scandal, as we call it, um, who helped me. He helped guide me through it. His law firm represented me for free, pro bono. They're a Washington, D.C. firm. There's no way that anybody who made you know $50,000 a year as a cop at the White House could afford a good Washington lawyer. They represented me for free. They got me through the scandal. I kept my life, my job, and made it through pretty good. He calls me up, Mark, after about a month or so after the book is out, and he said, these people that are calling you liars are defaming you and slandering you and TV and radio. And and he goes, very few people realize, know as much you know as you do than I do. And I said, you're right. And he said, well, I want to sue them. And I said, I'm not really interested in suing them because they're saying mean things about me. You know, I knew that was going to come out. He goes, well, here's the thing. I don't want to sue them for slander. I want to sue them for racketeering. It was something called civilian racketeering. And I said, I know what that is. You know, it's racketeering is basically, for those of your listeners that don't understand it, it was developed about 30 or 40 years ago. It's a law, basically. It's how they go after criminal organizations like drug cartels or the mafia. It's not just the illegal things they're doing. It's how they do it, how they communicate. What I'm saying is in my lawsuit is that I know One of the first people to come out and defame me and call me a liar was the retired Secret Service Agents Association. I know that they got their information literally from the Secret Service. They got talking points about who I was from the Secret Service. So a government police force lined up against one of its citizens. I was retired when the books came out, so I was just a regular citizen. And then they took that information and they sent it out to Media Matters and David Brock, and they use that information to lie about me. It's not the story that they told. It's how they did it. They used electronic transfer. They used email. They used organized crime methods to defame me. In using those methods and calling me a liar, they interrupted my ability to make a living. So we're not really going after from what they said. It's how they did it. We know that David Brock got this information from the person who got it from the Secret Service. And then he gave it to somebody else that was work for this that used to be in the Secret Service. And he went on CNN and told lies about me. And these people had never met me in my life. The truth of the matter is, if they were half as smart as they think they are, they would realize that and, and took some time to research who I was. There was actually the first thing they said was, is I never worked outside the Oval Office. Well, if they had taken their time and went on YouTube and researched, there's actually a video of me working outside the Oval Office. It was a documentary recorded, a documentary made called American Anthem when Bill Clinton was president. And it shows me standing in the hallway talking to George Stephanopoulos' assistant, shows me talking to George Stephanopoulos, whose office was right next to President Clinton's. And then a couple minutes after they start doing this interview and I'm on camera, President Clinton shows up and you can hear me in the background talking to the president. So the idea that, you know, that I wasn't there is false. Why would the Judge Starr's investigation subpoena me six times for my testimony 
And then eventually the, the chief of the Supreme Court at the time, Judge Rehnquist, ordered me to testify. So these people really set themselves up for failure and, and to be humiliated, hopefully someday in court. So my thing is, is to get them in court and to set the record straight. And the first people that I'm subpoenaing is Bill and Hillary Clinton and George Stephanopoulos and Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of, of uh, Chicago, because these people were all there. And I want them to sit there and say that I was not there when there's pictures of me standing there with them and other people in the administration. And everything that I said in my book was true. And they're going to have to, you know, I'm hoping to get my day in court. You know, lawsuits are slow. There's a lot of things going on in Washington, D.C., but it is going forward. And we've started a GoFundMe page to help support the lawsuit. Not me. I get no money from it. But the money does go to my lawyer, Mark Halbrin, to pay for the investigation. If we get them in court for the services of a stenographer and a recorder and, and somebody to film it when we depose these people, that's where we're headed. It is a slow process, but it's going very well. And uh, I'm looking forward to my day in court. And one of the things I'd like to point out to your listeners is when Mark first presented this to me, based on what Mark did for me and how good of a friend he was, I said, fine, I'll do whatever you want. What do I have to sign? And he said, you're still my client. And I said, that's fine. So if a lawsuit like mine gets Bill and Hillary Clinton and, and the Clinton machine and Media Matters and David Brock in the court and gives somebody the opportunity to prove how crooked these people are, I hope it's my lawsuit in the same fashion. Well, we know justice moves slowly, and there's a good chance that I believe the Clintons and Holder and all these other people are going to be in Guantanamo before they get your subpoena. What, what, I, what I know and, and what I believe, I mean, I have a couple of theories. I'm not sure if you and I talked about this before, but I had this theory for a while. The investigation that was supposedly the Russia, the Russia investigation against President Trump, supposedly for collusion that doesn't exist. I was hoping that it was a, it was a smokescreen for an actual investigation into the Clintons. And I wanted to believe that. Now, I don't know that to be true, but I wanted to believe it. Do I understand how bad the deep state is? Absolutely. I mean, I know for a fact, but I know how deep the deep state goes. And because I've seen it, I've been behind the curtain. You know, I, I worked at the in the Secret Service Uniform Division for 12 years. As you well know, one of the reasons you have me on so frequently as, as a guest, and I appreciate it, is that I've seen behind the curtain. You know, you, I, it's like the Wizard of Oz. And I've seen behind the curtain. And, and do I believe these people are that crooked? I know they are. I know exactly how they work. I know how the Clinton machine is. If you look what's going on right now with this Judge Kavanaugh, you know, just as an example, how is it possible that this guy has had five or six background investigations to have top secret clearances and this never came up before? Because it's not true. Now, I'm not saying these women are completely lying. I'm saying these women may have been abused. And they may have been attacked. They were also teenagers that were clearly party girls. And they were out having a good time as teenagers. In two different cases, the, the, the second woman that's accused, this judge, has admitted that she's misidentified other people that were there. They don't really have a clue what they're talking about. But here's what they're doing. This is all about keeping him out of the court so they can keep Roe v. Wade. And do I believe the deep state is, is invested in that? Absolutely. These people will say anything because I saw them do it to me. I saw when this Ken Starr during the President Clinton's impeachment scandal, when they identified myself and some of my coworkers as one, they wanted us to testify. The first thing that happened was the Clinton administration and the retired agents association started slandering us. Oh, no, they could never have access. They're just they're one step above you know, mall guards and this and that. And they said all these heinous things about us. And then they started attacking us individual as as I rose to the top, as the judge, as the star investigation went forward. And they knew, they believed they knew that I could tell them what they wanted. They started coming after me. And it's at one point, and I actually talk about this in the books, they were actually trying to float the ideal that Monica Lewinsky was there because she was having an affair with me, because I was having an affair with her. That's how crazy it got. So the idea that, that if anybody doesn't think that these women, these women who are, are all liberal left activists would not perjure themselves or come close to perjuring themselves 
and make it look like this guy is, is dirty and when he's not, you're wrong. That's exactly what they're doing, and that is the deep state. I mean, think about the things that we've seen the Democrats do over the years. I mean, the guy that they called the lion of the Senate, Ted Kennedy, they actually, the Democratic Party ran for him for office of, pres- of the presidency after he had drowned a woman in a car up in, in uh, Chappaquiddick. I mean, this is a guy who left a woman to drown, and then he spent years in the Senate, uh, and they call him the lion of the Senate. They ran him for president. That's how depraved they are. And when Bill Clinton was doing all his shenanigans, nobody wanted to listen to Juanita Broderick and hear her story. Nobody wanted to listen to Kathleen Wiley and hear her story. And nobody wanted to listen to Paula Jones. But they want to listen to these people to keep this good, decent man off the Supreme Court. And that's that's the deep state, and that's how corrupt they are. And you actually tried to save Bill Clinton from himself and get Monica banned from the Oval Office and how that turned out. I did. I did. So let's start with, you know, when I wrote the my first book, Crisis of Character, I talked about Hillary's temperament. And that's really what provoked me to write the book, I should say. Wanted, you know, I wanted the American people to know who the real Hillary was because I knew how incompetent she was. And I knew how poor of a performer that she was because I'd seen it up close. I'd been behind the curtain. And that's really what compelled me to write the book. If you wanted to vote for her, fine. But I knew that the real Hillary Clinton was incompetent and angry all the time and really was not this person they made her out to be. So I told the stories about how she berated me um, one time face to face and called me an a-hole and and referred to the whole uniform division as an a-hole, a bunch of a-holes. And then a couple months before that, when there was an incident at the White House and she blamed the uniform division for supposedly embarrassing Barney Frank. She demanded that President Clinton fire us. She wanted us. She wanted him to fire a thousand White House employees, a thousand Secret Service uniform division officers because they messed up what she thought she was doing. And really, we didn't do anything wrong. We were just doing our jobs. Um, she demanded the president fire a thousand police officers. That's the real Hillary Clinton. Uh, one day, I was standing post with a with an agent and uh, outside the Oval Office, and I said, "Hey, I hear HRC went off on somebody the other day and." smacked him in the back of the head. And he goes, well, it was me. And he said, what happened was we were in the limousine on the South Lawn getting ready to go somewhere. And Hillary got in the car and she said she was ready to go. And I said, I can't go till the shift leader comes out. And she started throwing a tantrum. She started stomping her feet on the floor of the car. And she was going to some meeting with these women that was going to be photographed. So she had a Bible to make herself look religious, which was a complete hoax based on what I saw in my time there, and she smacked him in the back of the head of the Bible. He turned around, and he made it very clear to her with some very stern language that it wouldn't be acceptable, and if he wanted to have, if you know, she wanted to have him fired, go right ahead, but you were never going to touch me again, that type of thing. And then she just stood there and looked at him, then the agent came and got in the car, and then later on when they got back, he wrote a report about it. And the service was embarrassed, and there's, you know, they said, look, if you want us to take you off the detail, we will. And he said, no, I'll suck it up and do like everybody else does when they have encounters with her, and I'll do the get, get the job done. And I know this guy personally. He told me the story firsthand, and, and I know it's 100% true because the Secret Service investigated it. Just like they investigated at the time, Mrs. Clinton was walking down the West Colonnade, and one of my former coworkers was walking by her. It was in the morning. He had been there a couple of months on duty. He was very happy to have a new job. And he said, good morning, First Lady. And she looked at him and said, go F yourself. That was investigated. And it's not like they can do anything to the First Lady, but they put it in record. And the Secret Service has all this in, in record of all these instances of her. And we know them to be true because they're always investigated and written down and recorded. So that's who the real Hillary Clinton is. You know, when it came to Bill Clinton, he was a funny guy. He was a nice guy. He was always a politician. I mean, he was interesting to work around. I, I wouldn't trust him to drive my, you know, 27 year old niece home because the guy has impulse issues. Definitely. And everything you've ever heard about him and, and the way he behaves with women is true. I, I'll tell you when I first, uh, Bill, I, I may have told you this before and I'm sure it's in the book, but when I first started the secret service in early 91, president Clinton hadn't formally announced that he was going to run. And I was down in, um, in Arkansas and on the edge of Tennessee, we were at this barbecue place. President Bush was still president, George Herbert Walker Bush, and he was still president. And he was meeting with some people in this barbecue place. And I was standing outside for about six hours 
on this detail. There was a deputy sheriff standing there with me. And uh, after a couple hours, things calmed down and he was reading the paper. And, and I, I, was, I looked at the paper over his shoulder and it was talking about the Arkansas governor, this young guy named Bill Clinton, may, may run for the office of the president. And it had these stories about these scandals that he was supposedly involved in as governor and as attorney general. And I was looking at it and I said, there's no way this guy will ever get elected. I mean, this craziness, all this, all these stories, 50 percent of it is usually true. And he looked at me, he goes, this sheriff, he said, let me tell you something, Gary. I'm from Arkansas. I know everything about him. And when you hear it, the crazier it is, it's true. No matter how crazy it is, it's true. Believe everything you hear and protect yourself. Always be wary. He said, they are, there's a reason they're known as the Arkansas Mafia. And he was right. Every rumor that we heard about him came true when he came to Washington, D.C. They just brought the Arkansas circus to D.C. And her behavior, his behavior, their fighting, his cheating, the way he treated women, the rumors about assault. One thing I wanted to mention about that, I'm sure you know who Juanita Broderick is, and she accuses President uh, Clinton of raping her when he was attorney general. And I believe her. I know it's an accusation. He's never been tried for it. But I believe her. When you listen to her story, when you see her interviewed on TV the first time back in the early 90s, right after Bill Clinton got elected, if you can't believe her story, then all these women that are testifying today about Judge Kavanaugh shouldn't be testifying because nobody was more convincing and believable than Juanita Brodra. You could feel her pain coming out of her as she spoke. That first time she was interviewed and told her story, it was on Sunday. Monday, I was working in the West Wing in the morning, and I'm telling you, you could smell it. It was palatable. Every woman in that that worked there had watched that interview, and they knew it was true. They couldn't even look at the Oval Office when they walked by it. They couldn't make eye contact with us. They knew it was true, and they were ashamed. One other incident I do remember you talking about was when the uh, Naval officer who was going to put towels in the uh, map room. Oh, or Stuart, yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah that, that, that's a cute little story. Oh, okay, the, the, <laughs> the map room. So there's two, there's a couple stories about the, the Navy stewards, but this, the one you're talking about was, it was Christmas time one year during President Clinton's first term. Christmas at the White House is magic. I kid you not. No matter who's president, the White House staff decorates that place. It is magic. It is, no matter what craziness was going on, I loved working there, especially at Christmas. It was always magical, all these trees, and they have all these traditions, and and they decorate it so beautifully, and they they celebrate Christianity, and they celebrate Hanukkah, and and all the different religions, you know, but but it's certainly Christmas time. And so anyway, it's Christmas, and and there was a a function going on. Uh, There's always functions going on there, but at Christmas time, basically the week before Thanksgiving to the week after New Year's, there's one to five functions at the White House every day. It's crazy. So anyway, this function's going on, and we get word from the White House staff, the kitchen staff, that there's a lot of extra food, and they've sent it down to our break room. So when we got off post, we went over to our break room, we went downstairs, and there were trays and trays of shrimp and shish kebab, and it was just great. So I went over and ate, and I was walking back to my post, my break room at the time, that break room, was under the east wing of the White House. So I was in the east side of the White House walking back to the west wing, and I was walking through the ground floor. There was a Secret Service agent posted there because the president was either – the president was nearby because there was an agent posted there, actually two agents and an officer who was always posted there. So I stopped. Hey, how you guys doing? Merry Christmas. And the officer there is a buddy of mine. We're talking. And as we're talking, the Navy steward walks up. They're, they're usually chiefs, Navy chiefs, senior chiefs or master chiefs. And this this one was a senior chief, and um, and he walks up, and he's like, and they're all Filipino men, you know, and he says to me in this real Filipino accent, uh, Merry Christmas, Gary, and I'm like, hey, buddy, how are you? And he's got a clean shirt in his hand, a clean white shirt, pressed beautifully. So I know exactly what he's doing because I've worked there a long time. He's taking it to the president, and as he's he's walking towards the map room, which is this room on the ground floor, and, and the door's closed, and he's going to, obviously the president's in there. I figure he's in there on a phone call. He opens up the door with his right hand, and he's looking back at us as he's talking to us. Now, the door's wide open. As we look in, we see President Clinton standing there, and he's making out with Eleanor Mondale. He's standing there toe-to-toe with this woman, Eleanor Mondale. 
and they're making out like high school seniors. And they never looked up. And when the steward saw the look on our faces, he, he like he knew something was up and he looked into the room. And then, of course, he was embarrassed. He quickly closed the door and ran down the hallway. And um, the agent looked at me and I looked at him and we looked at the, my buddy, the other officer. And he, they said, one, one of us, I think the agent said, it, did you see that? And I said, yep, welcome to Bill Clinton's Christmas, you know, and and we just kind of laughed it off because that was the typical behavior. And Eleanor Mondale was a reporter at the time who worked for one of the news agencies. And she was another person who was having an affair. That's what people, you know, people think that he was having one affair at that time with without with uh, Monica Lewinsky. And that's not true. There were multiple people. And I had to talk about I knew I ended up having to talk about three of them. And Eleanor Mondale was one of them. And the funny thing about Eleanor Mondale was, as I know you remember, is, uh, excuse me, her father was a former vice president, uh, Mondale. So I knew a lot about her to start with because the Secret Service protected her years ago when she was a teenager. And she was quite the wild teenager. Now, I, I do want to say to your audience that, you know, since then, Eleanor Mondale has passed away uh, in the early in mid 90s or late 90s. She got uh, cancer and she died. And but everything I've told you is fact. It's what I saw. It's what I heard. It's what I know happened. Um, it's what I experienced. Uh, and then if you uh, have time for the other Navy steward story, do you want to hear that one? How could you possibly take a bullet for these people? And maybe he'll explain that later because he is a man of honor and duty. But, Gary, go ahead with this story I haven't heard yet. Yeah. So I talk about it in the, in the first book. Um, and I think it's in the second book, Secret to the Secret Service, or at least part of it. So it's during the it's during the time that President Clinton is having this affair with Monica Lewinsky. And in the very beginning, I tried to ignore it. And then, you know, it, it just was happening so often. And then I tried to deny it. You know, I wanted to think that this guy was not like this. And, and it turns out he was. And so one day, I mean, by this time, I knew it was happening. I knew he was having an affair with her. I knew that they were conducting their affair behind the Oval Office in a study. So one day, the Navy steward comes out, very nice guy, a different Navy steward. And he's grumbling and kind of cussing under his breath again in his Filipino accent. And I said, what's wrong, buddy? And and uh, I said, what's wrong now? And he goes, I'm so tired of cleaning this up. It's humiliating. And I knew what he was talking about it because I'd come across it before. And Bill Clinton had been in that room uh, with Monica just recently they would commonly leave some tissues and the tissues might have lipstick on it, but sometimes they would have other fluids, you know, from a man on it. And then hand towels sometimes would be covered with this fluid. So n- n- this steward was embarrassed, you know, to have to clean this up. And he knew, like I knew that eventually this was going to blow up in, the, in their faces because it always does. And we knew that we were standing around when it blew up, that we were going to get hit with it. We were afraid. And that's really what happened. Exactly what happened. Stuart was going to, I said, what are you going to do with those towels? Because there were no, these nice cloth towels. And I know what they do with them. They take them, they send them downstairs to the Navy mess and they wash them. Well, these guys are young men. They know what's in that towel. So I didn't want any more rumors. I didn't want the rumors spreading further. So I said, Nell, don't send them to the laundry. Let's throw them out. So I got a trash can bag and I had Nell put the towels in there. Later on, and I I tied them in a knot, and I put them in my gym bag, and later on, I destroyed them. Now, I have to put this in context. This is one of those times where you mentioned that I tried to save Bill from his own behavior, and this is one of them where, you know, I I got rid of this towel. They'll put it in context. This was way before the scandal had broke. It wasn't like, because when the scandal first broke, I panicked. I almost panicked because I thought, oh, my God, I destroyed evidence. I'm going to have to explain that I destroyed, but it wasn't evidence then. It was the, it was, you know, a leftover from a president who made terribly bad decisions, you know, in his weird sexual escapades. So I took the bag and later on I destroyed it. I, I, um, on the way home from work, that's, uh, you know, that was one of the, a very bizarre thing. And, and I mean, think about that, you know, how many people in the world can say that they held, you know, the president's fluid, you know, in a bag because you were trying to protect them. I've really thought I'd be more likely to get struck by lightning than have that happen to me. But uh, so far, I haven't gotten struck by lightning. So keep your fingers crossed. You were very well aware of the type of people they were. And as I mentioned, and you mentioned to me one time that you would have taken a bullet for these people. Yeah. 
I can explain that. Please do. Yeah. So here's the thing. I have to go back to when I first joined the Air Force. When I first joined the Air Force and I was a security policeman, and when I started my training, one of the first things they made clear to us was you should always have a will prepared. Always have a will prepared. Make sure whoever you want to get your insurance or your money or your possessions is always up to date. And we looked at each other, all of us, like we were just probably about 30 of us in a class. And we looked at each other like they were crazy. And he said, here's why. Because if someday you're in the Air Force as a security policeman and somebody takes you hostage and says, if you don't give us a fighter plane or if you don't let us have access to the nuclear weapon storage site, we're going to kill this guy. Understand you're dead because we will shoot you ourselves because we will not negotiate with terrorists or criminals and we will never, ever give up, you know, the American way or, you know. So that's my mindset. And as time went on and I, I, I got into the Secret Service and I came to the conclusion even before I was in the Secret Service, there are certain circumstances that my life is worth expending to protect other things. The innocent our way of life, the Air Force, the Constitution, the American way of life, it is worth it. Just like when a soldier goes onto the battlefield right now, as we're speaking in places in Afghanistan that we can't even pronounce and other places in the world, they've made that decision to keep our way of life going. And, and I made that decision too. Now, when it comes to the Clintons, the Secret Service has a saying, the American people elects them and we protect them. The Secret Service protects them. And you have to adopt that mentality. I had my own personal uh, political views. I was very conservative, and they weren't, and they were crazy criminal people. But half the country approximately wanted them in office. So I can't ignore half the country. I have to protect them just like I would protect somebody that I did like, or I would protect my family member, or I would protect anybody else. And you just have to set that emotion aside. This is what it is. You took an oath. You said you would do it. You stand up and you do it. Even if, And I told you when I first met you, when the first book came out during the campaign, if I was in the Secret Service and, God forbid, Hillary gotten elected, I would have still protected her 100% of my ability because that's the job, because somebody pulled a lever in a booth somewhere and wanted her in office. To keep the Constitution as pure as you can, which is hard to do these days, you, people have to make those decisions. And that's how, I, that's how I frame it up. It's the right thing to do, so I do it. Yeah, but in today's world, we know that they are selected. Those voting machines are corrupt. But I, I salute your honor and for the man that you are. Thank you. And just a little aside here. You, you mentioned that the White House is full of magic during Christmas time. And as we all know, the only magic that was in the White House during the Obama administration was of a voodoo type magic. Yeah, yeah. Some different times. Yeah, I wasn't there then, but uh, there were definitely some different times. Your second book about secrets of the Secret Service, of which you didn't give up any secrets of the Secret Service, but you do explain how crumbling the Secret Service actually is these days. A little yeah. detail on that. Yeah, so uh, my second book originally was going to be about the word regicide, which I'm sure you understand means it, it, it's a term, the word regicide is the term for slaying of a king. We were going to write a book all about assassination from the first ruler, you know, up into modern day American presidents and, and foreign presidents. And after about two months of doing research and writing, I looked at my coworker one day, Grant Schmidt, and I said, Grant, we're writing the wrong book. And he said, what do you mean? I said, the Secret Service is failing. It has failed. And this ideal where we, you know, we have all these stories about the Secret Service. And e even when I was in the Secret Service, they would say, people would say, you, we're the best at what we do. And I'm like, how's that possible? And Grant said, keep going. You know, I, I get what you're saying. Keep talking to me. So I said, OK, Grant, look at it from this perspective. By the time. John Kennedy was assassinated in 1963 in Dallas. Setting aside all the conspiracy theories and all that, that stuff, set that aside. By the time he was assassinated in 63 in Dallas, four presidents had been shot at in open cars or vehicles. What's their learning curve? Why were they still allowing people to be presidents to be in open cars? 
You have to ask yourself, how stupid were these agents at the time? Why were they still allowing them to use open vehicles? And you could you can apply that mentality to a lot to a, all the assassinations and the attempts. By the time Ronald Reagan gets shot by John Hinckley in an unsecured crowd, a few years before, when Jerry Ford was president, two women shot uh, tried to shoot at at uh, Ford in open unsecured crowds in a 40 day period. It's insane. So that's what we. My idea wasn't to make the Secret Service look bad, and I don't. I tell you the truth. They they're an agency, and I did a lot of research. I did. I went down to Washington D.C. I didn't contact people that I knew and ask for information because I didn't want to taint anybody. I didn't want anybody ever have to say that they helped me with the book because I knew if they were still working, just like when I wrote the first book, I didn't tell anybody about crisis of character because I wanted them to have deniability because I know how vindictive the Secret Service and the people in Homeland Security can be. I interviewed people and I did. I watched 35 to 40 hours of video of former directors testifying. It's all on C-SPAN and YouTube. And here's one of the things to tell you how bad a shape they're in. In 2000, here's a couple of things. 2015, the director of the Secret Service at the time, Joe Clancy, who was a nice guy. I knew him. We worked together for years. He was the director of the Secret Service. He had to admit to Congress that with a $2 billion, that's billion with a B, a $2 billion budget that year, that they could not tell them how it was spent. They could not tell the Congress how much money was spent on protection, on cars. They did Not only did they not have an accounting system, they did not have an accountant. They just spent money however they wanted to. Think about that. A, a government agency, no, no company could ever run itself like that. And that's one of the, the examples that I point out in, in my second book, Secrets of the Secret Service. These people that are supposedly the best at what they do really aren't. It, it's smoke and mirrors. And we used to call it that when, when I was in the Secret Service. Now, don't get me wrong. The frontline men and women, the GS-13s, the uniform division officers, even some of the GS-14s, these people are putting their lives on the line right now to protect President Trump, former presidents, a lot of people, and they're good people, and they mean well. But when they go up the chain of command and they become these executives, they lose their way, and they do some really dumb things. Uh, one example is, you know, during President Truman's administration, um, there was a, a assassination attempt on Harry Truman. He was staying at Blair House, and when I tell, I talk, I tell, draw the whole story out for the audience. Um, in if you read my book, Secrets of the Secret Service. A White House police officer at the time, the predecessor to the Uniform Division, uh, was killed. His name was Leslie Colfeld. And after Leslie Colfeld's death, the White House police wanted to start this benevolent fund so they would have some money to help the family of dead officers bury their, their loved ones. There wasn't all this insurance at the time and all these programs. So they started this White House police benevolent fund. Eventually, it became when the when the White House police eventually became the Secret Service Uniform Division. It became the Uniform Division Benefit Fund, and they were allowed to sell White House stuff with White House emblem on it and stuff with the Secret Service emblem on it. And the money went to the Benefit Fund, and they donated the money if they didn't need it that year for officers who got sick or, or their families. Um, it went; they gave it to charity, and then some of the money was allowed to be used. For the officers, we had a big cookout every summer and for the officers, and we had a big Christmas party. And then all the other money went to um, you know, their families or to charities. Well, the Secret Service agents over the years knew how much money these guys would make from this charitable organization, and they wanted control of it. They tried everything they could do to get control of it, but they couldn't at the time because the Uniform Division had a letter from Harry Truman. This this benevolent fund was the wish of a former president, Harry Truman. And these guys over the years, these agents, tried to get some control of it because they wanted control of that money. And uh, they destroyed that benefit fund where it doesn't even exist now and so they could start their own. That tells you how how corrupt and and just heartless these people are. They basically took away the Uniform Division's ability to buy flowers or to help with the, the fees when somebody dies, when one of their coworkers or officers dies. Think about that. But I talk about it in my book, and I talk about many other things in there 
that uh, the problems with the Secret Service. Their management system, listen, they're doing, they're good people when they start out, but their management system is, is horrendous. Basically, the best way to, the best way to define their management system, actually, a, a former Secret Service agent back in the 90s defined it very well. When he was, when he retired from the Secret Service, he sent out a message on the old telex machine, which is like today's modern day email. And he put a letter out to the director and everybody in the Secret Service about the problems with the Secret Service, how poorly they treated their employees. And at the end of the letter, he said this, the Secret Service has the Cherokee Indian mentality. They treat their employees like the Cherokee Indians treated horses. Cherokee Indians and other Indian tribes were famous for when they needed to, they would ride their horses until they died and then they ate them. And that's what the Secret Service did with its employees. They ran them into the ground, and when they were no good to them, they either fired them or they died from fatigue or from accidents, um, and they treated them like crap. And that's their, that's their mentality. Now, I, I do have to say that the, the modern day, today's director, his uh, last name is uh, Elias, I believe. He's a former Marine Corps two-star general. Now, he's not a former Secret Service agent. He's a former, he used to run an aviation wing in the Marine Corps. So he's a good squared away guy. And he is trying to make some changes. And after my book came out, Secret to the Secret Service, he did make a change that, that people inside the Secret Service contacted me and said, this is because of your book, Gary. They read your book. The, the, the friends of mine that worked in the headquarters said, your book is all over headquarters. They're all reading it. And they're terrified that the truth is out about their management style. And they're trying to fix it. So I'm, I'm very happy to hear that it, that, that it helped do some change, but they have a long way to go. Have you heard the belief that the military requested that Trump run for president because they were sick and tired of the NSA and Homeland Security using these agencies against the people that they're supposed to be protecting? And the only reason that Trump is alive today and the conspiracy theories are that there have already been three attempts on his life, of two which I've interviewed enough people to know and believe that there were already two attempts on his life, that the military is keeping him alive because evidently a perhaps inept Secret Service couldn't, as well as the stories that there were hitmen within the Secret Service themselves. Yeah, so so I don't believe anybody in the Secret Service would take or protect his life. Do I believe there's some incompetence there at times? There is. But I, I can't say that I know for a fact that the military is doing any kind, did any kind of request or manipulation to help make him president. But what I do know is, is they love this guy. The military people that have to work around the president, Trump, and the Secret Service, they have never been treated so well. I shouldn't say never, but but the Trump family treats these people so well, so kindly, so generous. They're thrilled to be protecting this guy. There are when it comes to attempts against presidents, some of the stuff I talk about, some of it I don't, um, because I don't want to give up any secrets and I don't want to harm anybody that gave me the information. But here's the thing: there are attempts against all protectees all the time, even the former presidents, whether they're accidental attempts because when I say accidental, I don't mean accidental. I mean, for instance, Mrs. Obama, maybe tomorrow is going to be at a store shopping and somebody sees her and says, Oh my God. And tries to attack her with something, you know, that kind of attack as opposed to a cold coordinated terrorism type attack on a, uh, a sitting president. There are threats against the president all the time during Bill Clinton's time. A director of the Secret Service at the time looked me right in the eye and said, Gary, there are the threat level on Bill Clinton this or this quarter was higher than Abe Lincoln before he got assassinated. And we all know how that went. And he was using a little bit of levity and humor to, to paint a dark picture for me. So I understood what the what, what was going on because we were on a detail, getting ready to go on a detail, leave the White House where it was easy to protect them. And he was relaying to me the nice guy that he was, you know, how serious things were. So it's like that for every president. There's always somebody that wants to do them harm. Do I believe the deep state is incompetent? And do I believe a lot of people wouldn't care if President Trump, something happened to him? 
Yeah, I believe there are people that, that wouldn't care. But I believe the Secret Service is still doing its job. But I will tell you, if they don't, it'll be obvious, unfortunately. What do you think the odds are of them all, which goes from Obama, Bill, Hillary, Lynch, Comey, Rob Emanuel, you know, just the entire Obama White House are going to we're going to see them do a perp walk. You know, what are the odds? I don't know. I would tell you that I wish it to be true. Here's what I want. I want a trial. I want Hillary Clinton to have to testify under oath, either because of my racketeering trial. I want to know, first thing I want to know is how come she hasn't been charged with the misuse of government emails and top, and top secret information, classified information? How come nobody's been charged that this classified information was found on Anthony Weiner's computer? That's the charge. That's what I want to see. I want to see that. I want to know why nobody has been charged or there's not an investigation going on of the fake dossier that was used to generate an investigation on a, on a, a, a somebody running for president by a sitting president. That's third world banana republic action. That's that's crazy stuff. And nobody's being – that's what I want to see. I want to see those trials, those investigations, those subpoenas, those trials. But it's not happening. Do I believe it could? You know, I want to believe it, but I think it's unlikely. But I think with a trial like mine that we could stumble onto something that, that could force them to do it. I want to, I want to believe that this attorney general is not as laid back and as – I don't want to use – I hate to use the word incompetent, but I will – um, as he looks, but I want to know why these investigations haven't been started. Anybody with two brain cells realizes that former FBI director Comey let Hillary Clinton off the hook. He said he was. He said the whole country. It was. It's insane. Everything that she did, people have um, gover other government employees have gone to jail for. It's insane. We don't have two standards. We're not supposed to. We're supposed to have one standard. Lady Justice is supposed to be blind, and that has gone away, unfortunately. Right now, it looks like she's got a bare pair of bi bifocals on. I was going to say, if you follow Q as much as we do, and those of us on 24-7 Patriot Soapbox, uh, the, the premise is it is a game, and the point of Sessions being inept and bickering with President Trump is all a ploy because now you may notice that the Democrats are very much in support of Sessions and they don't want him going anywhere. But the thing is, he is in the background and and he is sealing indictments and they put five million dollars into Guantanamo and they're lining up the judges for military tribunals. So wishing for this to happen and it actually happening, uh, I got to believe it is in the process. <laughs> yeah. I, I Listen, those things don't happen in, in, a, in a bubbles. People do find out about it and they do report them to whoever Q is. Yeah. And I hope it goes forward. And I will tell you, I will dance an Irish jig and, and toast to anybody you want. I mean, it would just be a great day to see somebody held accountable for this insanity. Yep. Have you heard about there's over 60,000 sealed indictments, which include pedophiles, corruption, money laundering, drug laundering, gang, you know, and there are some thousands of uh, CEOs and executives who are all leaving their jobs. There are also many senators and congressmen who are not going to be running again because they know the dirt that's hanging over them. They know that they're guilty and they, they want to try to leave office before it happens, before the, the other shoe drops. Right. And the biggest turn of anybody I've seen is Lindsey Graham. Now, Lindsey Graham used to be McCain's puppet. All of a sudden, now that McCain isn't around, and, you know, the stories about McCain are so true. He was seen photographed with uh, al-Baghdadi, the ultimate in the al-Qaeda terrorists. 
he had been supplying them with arms and yada, yada, yada. Well, evidently, I believe somebody got to Lindsey Graham as well, because if you watch him now, he is such a staunch Republican and anti anything having to do with taking this president down. Have you noticed any of that? I have. And and here's the thing. You, you kind of stumbled on the, one of the things I used to say about Lindsey Graham. You know, he's a nice guy. I actually um, was around him, him and McCain and a couple of these other people years ago during the, one of the government shutdowns when Bill Clinton was president. He's a nice guy, but I used to say about him, he's a Republican 15 minutes or a conservative 15 minutes a year just to get elected. And I never thought he was that strong. But you, do I see him swinging 180? Absolutely. I do. I see what you see. And and it, it does give you that fuel for thought that, that absolutely he knows what's coming down and uh, he wants to look like he's a big Trump supporter and he wants to, you know, whether he's done something wrong or not, he wants to insulate himself. Absolutely. Have you been watching Trump's speech at the U.N. and his his press conference afterwards? Have you I been- did. I, I think. Listen, I think he's fabulous. I think he talks. He talks like we want to hear somebody talk. He doesn't talk like a politician. He talks like a businessman that gets stuff done. I think he's brilliant, and I think he works on a level that these liberal. Listen, it's not that the liberals don't think he's smart and don't think he's a good president. They're terrified of him because he is. I like the guy. Yeah, they see their future. Uh, you know, they're talking about the blue wave and that the, the memes of the blue wave or the tidy bowl being flushed. Yeah. Yeah, the um, it's going to be this this election in in a couple of months is going to be um, is going to be fascinating to watch. I'm the worst at predicting what's going to happen, but but here's I am going to say this, based on the the fake news and all the the craziness of the 2016 presidential election, I think the the, the Republicans are going to keep what they have, and I think they may even gain some. I think this ideal this of the socialism being the way Americans want to uh, go is, is, is not true. I don't care. Even millennials, once they understand really what socialism is, that it leads to communism and it's never worked anywhere. You know, I think, I think we're going to be fine after the election. I think president Trump is going to be able to keep the uh, steamroller going, as I like to say, and keep getting this, getting the stuff done. And one of the things I think he needs to do is he needs to build that wall. He needs to he needs to stop signing bills and, and start vetoing stuff when it comes to the budget if he's not getting what he wants because he promised the deplorables you know yes. that he was going to build a wall and yeah. that's what we want to see I want to see the wall I want to see this big beautiful wall is in every place that they can build it and the ideal you know it's funny because you hear some of these crazy Democrats say you can't build a wall across mountains the Chinese did it two thousand years ago I think we're fine <laughs> so. I want to see the wall built. I want to see him keep his, his promises that he has been doing. And I think we're going to be fine. And when these when these indictments start dropping, it'll be a happy day. My guess would be if it's going to work out. And you've probably figured this out already. Is after if he gets reelected in 2020, that's because he's got he, he's in the driver's seat then. And he and th- they can start these indictments dropping and they can start these investigations and start going public. And that's what I really hope for. So is there any more coming from you? Do you have another book planned? Were you just concentrating on your lawsuit? And yeah, you- I, I, I'm not, I'm not contemplating writing another book. I mean, there's one I could write. I could write a book about the air marshals, similar to the secret service, secrets of the secret service about the problems with the air marshal program, because the original startup of the air marshals after 9-11, 90% of their management came from the Secret Service, retired Secret Service people. So they kind of they spread the virus, as I like to say. But I'm not writing that book right now. I'm not going to I don't have any plans to write a book. Um, what I'm working on is trying to take the first book, Secret, uh, excuse me, Crisis of Character, and turning it into a screenplay and getting it made into a movie. That's what I'd like to do. And uh, that's what I'm working on. And you might as well tell us where we can get your book and where we can help help you afford a lawyer to take these criminals down one more notch. Yeah, well, you can go on to my, my web page is official, Gary, G-A-R-Y, J, Byrne, B-Y-R-N-E, 
official Gary J. Byrne, is my webpage, and it has connections to the lawsuit if you want to uh, take a look at it. It also has a description of more of what we're doing, and uh, if somebody wants to do- donate, they can find it there. And again, that money is not for me to live on. That's to to push the lawsuit forward and to pay for lawyers and for investigators and stenographers. And then um, my books can be found on Amazon.com, Secrets of the Secret Service, the still in bookstores, and and you might find Crisis of Character in paperback in the bookstores. And both the books, again, are, are on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, um, th- those, those stores. And uh, I greatly appreciate um, anybody who uh, wants to read it and buys it. It's, uh, it's an honor to uh, have written it. So let me tell you this. If you ever hear anybody say retirement's boring, well, then they don't know how to retire. So I am, I've been retired since 2016. I'm home. I, I take care of my kids. I do things for my wife that I couldn't do before. I am going to have to go back to work. You know, I need to generate a little bit more money. My retirement's not, you know, it's good, but, you know, I, I need to generate a little bit more money. The books are, sales are slowing down a little bit, so I'm going to have to go back to work. I'm looking for a job right now, but at the same time, I'm trying to sell the screenplay for Crisis of Character. And um, and we'll see what happens. Um, but I am actually actively look, looking on job sites and sending out resumes. I could go get a job teaching and uh, at a shooting range and, and, and or an academy. Um, but the truth is, I think I want to try something different. I want to do something that's not law enforcement for a while. I mean, I did it for a long time. Um, so right now, that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm enjoying life. I'm grateful. Uh, you know, it's nice to be home and not traveling a lot to go to the the church on Sundays with the family and, and, you know, do uh, cookouts and it's, uh, I'm enjoying that part of it. So that's pretty much what I'm doing. I still do radio shows like yours. I do interviews when people want me to. Um, I write opinion papers about what's going on. I just post it. Um, matter of fact, it's on my website, official Gary J. Byrne, B Y R N E. I just posted a, 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 an opinion paper about the judge Kavanaugh. And what was going on? There's opinion papers about school shootings and how to stop a school shootings. I have opinion papers about um, anti-terrorism stuff and 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 about crazy uh, politicians too. So there's all kinds of stuff on official Gary J. Byrne. It sounds like you got a life you deserve, sir, for being such a, an honorable man. And I Thanks. want to thank you so very much for gracing the starship again. My pleasure. Listen, you know that you know how to get a hold of me anytime you want to uh, to uh, talk and mull over the craziness of, of the world we're living in. I'd be glad to. Thank you again for contacting me. Yeah, and I hope to be calling you up and uh, having you on the show when we do that jig because they're all in Guantanamo. So thank you, brother, so very much for your time and. Please uh, check out Gary Byrne's YouTube channel. Uh, put Gary Byrne in uh, the YouTube search and you'll find it. He has videos on guns. And I can tell you the thing is he's not getting rich by monetizing his YouTube videos, right? <laughs> no, I'm not. Nope. It's just out there for consumption. Amen. So you take care of yourself and I'm sure I'll be talking to you soon. And thank you thank- so very much, Gary. My pleasure. Take care, Bill. Hope you feel better. Good luck with the surgery. Take care. Hey, give 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 the kids and the wife a hug for me, all right? Well, I will. Thank you so much, Bill. Take care. Hey, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.